uh, orthopedic cases with a um, ankle and foot surgeon uh, on that day and we were about halfway through our um, caseload when uh, the patient uh, presented for a total ankle replacement. Um, she was 37 years old, otherwise healthy, with congenital club feet and um, met with her and uh, discussed the different anesthetic options and we decided that the best choice for her would be to um, do a general anesthetic with an ankle uh, block uh, called a popliteal fossa block for post-operative pain control. Um, so we positioned her for the block, um, had our monitors on, did everything that we usually um, do for this block, um, placed the block without any problems at all, and as we were getting ready to reposition her on the stretcher and take her to the operating room, um, the patient all of a sudden got very confused and progressed to having a grand mal seizure. Um, and I knew immediately that she had gotten some of the local anesthetic into her circulation. So we positioned her, called a, <coughs> called a code, and um, watched over the next minute and a half as her uh, heart rhythm went to um, a complete ventricular fibrillation and, and the loss of circulation. So we started uh, in with our cardiopulmonary resuscitation and our advanced cardiac life support. Um, had the full team there doing the resuscitation. So we crashed across the hall and uh, went into that room and within about 30 minutes of the onset of this event, um, she, we had her on uh, cardiopulmonary by bypass through a, a midline sternotomy. And it took about a minute and a half on bypass before her rhythm came back and she then started to stabilize. Um, and I think it wasn't until that point where the whole impact of what had just happened started to sink in on me. Um, you know, up until that point we had been um, just sort of in our automated uh, uh, functional resuscitative role and now that was over and, um, you know, what I had just precipitated started to, to sink in on me and I, I felt very strongly at that point that I had to uh, reach out and, and to talk to the family about you know what had happened and, and uh, my part in that. So I went up to the uh, family liaison area with the orthopedic surgeon um, and found the patient's husband uh, in a small conference room um, by himself with the door shut, just pacing back and forth, uh, panicked and just um, you know just full of fear and anxiety just visible in every action that he was doing all over his face and and when we went into the room he just came at me with emotion and um, you know just very physical uh, towards me um, asking me you know what what had what had I done to his beautiful wife and I just realized at that point you know now I was just at the full impact of, of what had just happened. I woke up a couple of days later in the <coughs> cardiac intensive care unit. Um, I, I didn't have any grasp on what had just happened. Um, it took me a, a couple of days to really, really figure out what had happened. Then that was it. I was just spending time recovering physically in, in the ICU and then I got transferred to the step-down unit and that's when I started to have a real sense of maybe what had happened. I, I had a conversation with somebody. I was told I had an allergic reaction and Right there and then, an allergic reaction to the anesthesia just didn't sit well with me, so I was already feeling distrustful. The irony of it, though, is the whole 10 days I was in the hospital, nobody spoke about it. Um, the pink elephant was in the room and nobody was acknowledging it. And, and at one point, I remember thinking, oh, maybe it wasn't that big a deal if nobody's talking about it. And um, I got discharged from the hospital with uh, notes on how to care for my chest and also instructions about a visiting nurse coming and and that was it that was the extent of my support the whole time in the hospital my husband was given no support not once did somebody say mr. Kenny this has been an awful event can somebody talk to you can we do you want us to help you talk to your children what can we do for you there was nothing over the next 10 days um, I tried very hard to um, establish communication with with uh, the patient um, and I was prevented both by 
the family as well as really a lack of any support on part of the hospital to facilitate any kind of communicative process uh, was essentially told that the, the best thing I could do is leave the communication up to the hospital and to risk management. And when she was discharged um, about 10 days later, um, I had had no contact at all with her. And I was really devastated by that um, and felt that I had to do something. And, and what I essentially decided to do, because I had no other choice I felt at the time was to write a letter um, to her on my own without the hospital participating in it. The first six weeks at, um, being home, I, I was really just grateful to be alive. Uh, I had received a letter from the anesthesiologist who had been part of my case. My initial reaction to the letter was um, that he was doing damage control and I filed the letter and I didn't look back. I, I was just trying not to deal with it. I wasn't ready for any any type of uh, resolution in that area. I just wanted to get on with my life. I didn't hear anything for about six months and during that period of time I think on my side you know I started going back into my clinical routine um, but really continued to feel very isolated um, in you know what what to expect on the, the uh, quality assurance side, on the um, root cause analysis side. All of these processes were uh, in play without my even knowing what was going on and I would just kind of be told I had to go to this area um, you know for a, for a meeting um, the day before um, have no idea what the content was going to be other than that they were going to be talking about my involvement in, in this case. And six months after this I felt like I was having a nervous breakdown. I, I had no idea what was happening. I would cry when I was driving the car. I would I, was, I felt like I was falling apart. I was dealing with my kids' emotions. They were really, um, this had really had an impact on them. My husband, every time he looked at me, he would cry. I started to um, feel guilty that I was alive. It, it just, it kept building and building over the next couple of months. I met with my orthopedic surgeon and we had a conversation. I said, you know, I, I, I want to talk about this. And, and he said, I do too, Linda. And he said, let me tell you what that day was like. He started to talk about it and then started to cry. I thought, wow, this really impacted more than my husband and I. And that's when I decided I needed to do something to, to feel better. And one of the things I decided to do was um, contact Dr. Vim Pelt so I could let him know I didn't blame him. I really believed it was an adverse event that nobody could have foreseen. And I, th I w just wanted to, to let him know I didn't hold him re responsible and that um, I wanted to know if he was okay, if I was suffering this much, I, I couldn't imagine if I was the one responsible for almost killing somebody, how I would have felt. And um, part of my, I, I did want to live with the burden of, of having somebody live with that, with that feeling without some closure. I, I figured my forgiving him would give me the ability to move on. About six months later, um, I got a phone uh, message from the patient saying that she um, was trying to get in touch with me. And at that point, I really, um, you know, was still walking around with this knot in my stomach about what had happened and finally had my opportunity to, to clear the air and to open up this communication. And, and for me, it was a real decision point because everybody, the administration, the hospital, everybody was, was saying, don't go there, don't talk to anybody, uh, don't talk to the patient about this. And, you know, my integrity and compassion was saying do this and you know I think ultimately I just chose to follow what I thought was the right thing to do and then I initiated the conversation the, the, uh, the phone conversation with her and it turned out to be the best conversation that I've ever had um, in my life. I think the, the most amazing thing about that conversation for me was the patient offering me forgiveness for what I had done and for me you know, I'd been carrying this, this weight, this 400-pound gorilla on my back for six months, and all of a sudden it was lifted off, um, you know, it jumped off my back. And uh, I felt free, and I felt like I could take on uh, my life again and, and go forward in a productive way. I'll tell you, it was, the phone call was a, a place for me personally to, to move forward um, emotionally from, from this event. Um, it, it, I, I can't tell you, I felt like he talks about 
it, he felt that there was a um, gorilla lifted off his shoulders or, or weight, and I, I, I just felt like I was, I, I was free. I was free to move on, um, to let go, to let go of this incident and, and, and to get on with my life. You know, I, he told me about what had happened. Um, he was probably more honest than anybody had been with me up until that point. Um, you know, I wanted to know if this impacted him, and I remember him, you know, sharing with me that that it impacted him. It really had an impact on him. After the year anniversary, because that was very pivotal and emotional for me, it just I look back at the whole year and thinking how grateful I was to be alive. But there was a sense that I was alive and that I knew that there was this big um, hole within the system and shame on me if I didn't do anything about it. So I wrote a letter to the administration. I told them who I was, what had happened, and I really gave that in, a, in one paragraph that said, you know, this was happening to other people if it was happening to me, and they needed to find a way to, to reach out to the, their patients. At the time, I wasn't thinking too much about the clinician. It wasn't until later when I met more cl clinicians who had been part of my code team that I realized that this had much more of an impact on everybody, not just my family and myself. And while I was doing that, I received a letter back from the hospital, two letters from the administrators, and they were cold and uncompassionate. And I'll tell you, if I had ever been angry about this incident, it was after those two letters. I um, could appreciate why some patients want to sue um, to, to be to, to have that incident happen to you and to get letters like this again, it's like, I hate the word victim, but it's, it felt like being victimized twice. I'm grateful for the letters. They made me, motivated me to do um, what I probably never would have been able to do, and that's to, uh, to start an organization that, that um, would offer these services. It wasn't until Linda started to share with me the, the difficulties that she had had in that period between uh, the phone call in our meeting with trying to get support and trying to communicate with um, the institution um, and really the lack of, of compassion in, in, in the responses that she got and the recognition that there really wasn't anything there um, to tap into that really I think pulled me back into you know this situation and made me realize for myself that I really had been unsupported as well because I think up until that point I really in a lot of ways hadn't even recognized that there was no support uh, because I was trained not to expect support and I was trained to be tough and I was trained to suck it up and uh, that it was essentially a sign of weakness to acknowledge impact of you know adverse events. Um, and you know, and, and I had the now sort of the, the retrospectoscope, the ability to look back and to recognize, wow, you know, I've been through a hell of a ride myself, you know, and I think this was really where for me it was a transformation from a, a personal healing to a cause for others. So it became clear, why isn't there, I, I, I remember saying to him, why do you think there isn't, you know, there's a code team when a code happens, why isn't there a team to emotionally support, you know, the clinician, the patient, the family when these things happen? It makes sense. And then we had the brainstorming session. We come up with some, um, you know, pretty lightweight goals. You know, the name of the organization, <laughs> um, the, um, the, the mission statement. And actually, ironically, Rick doesn't, he doesn't remember this, but of all those people there, um, he was the one that, actually he's the one that came up with our original um, mission statement. To, did you know that? No. <laughs> so you don't remember that because, <laughs> and I think, I, I think because everybody was going all over the place and you just simplified it and said, how about, um, you know, to support healing and restore hope and, and that's been our tag ever since. And who would have thought? <laughs> the guy that almost killed me came up with our mission statement. <laughs> so, um, well, I think, I mean, I think for me, you know, this was a journey um, that I'd put myself through multiple hoops, and every time I did it and kind of jumped into the unknown, 
um, and ended up with a good result, um, it sort of reinforced the idea that hoop jumping was a good thing to do <laughs> and uh, that it worked. So it's, you know, so for me it's, 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 it's a story about the institution that was set in, in a tradition of silence, recognizing that that wasn't working and saying we're going to step up to the plate to look at how we support clinicians. Um, let's look at how we actually support patients when an adverse event occurs. Um, being receptive to, to myths, to the idea, and how the relationship might develop between the institution and, and the organizations, um, you know, was, was a tremendous turnaround. And I think that to be able to participate in, in uh, you know, policy development to try and uh, you know, formalize and to put into action um, a process of disclosure and apology and support when an adverse event occurs throughout, uh, you know, the, the partners network um, throughout the Harvard hospital system uh, was tremendous. You know, we need to start spreading this message of being human. I'm the one about educating consumers, you know, the bottom line. That it's okay to be normal. Um, to have um, normal reactions, to have normal events, to, to feel the impact and to be there to support that. Um, and, you know, I think the other thing that for me has been very powerful as well is just having the opportunity to, to share this story and the message um, throughout the country um, to different groups, to clinicians, to risk managers, to executives, to, uh, to nurses, um, Different groups that represent the entire spectrum of healthcare, and I think that that's you know that's the big challenge that that MITS um, and that healthcare institutions have now going forward in patient safety is to be still vigilant and active in all of the preventive measures and all the policy development, but at the same time to say when an adverse event occurs, deal with the sharp end of the uh, you know of the needle and, and take care of this stuff. What's that quote about? Mark Twain. Yeah, what is that? Um, they didn't know it was impossible, so they went ahead and did it. <laughs> <laughs>